washed up. Sorry? <laughs> Welcome to the island of discarded women, my friend. I used to be somebody. Are you that woman on the radio? Your island job is peladora de papas. Uh, sorry, what? Potato peeler. 87% match for uh, your skills. Okay, that's not... Anyway, what is the second best match then? Host of the island podcast. Are you kidding me? No, no, see, that's me. That That's perfect for me. That's... Okay, 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 Mary. Okay, okay. I got your new chip inserted into your lava lamp. You've been down for a few months, Mary, so let's just see if this is going to work. Okay, here we go. And hello, Mary, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, my name is Mira. Yeah, there you go. Please listen carefully as my menu has changed. Oh. For English, say one. Yes. Para español. I don't want one, diga, one, one, Mary, no. one. Oh, Mary, you're back, you're back. I'm sorry, was that a question? And you're a little sassier too, I think. Okay. While well, you've been down, while well, we've been waiting for your chip, so much has happened. So I much. I found Chips Ahoy, oh. an American chocolate chip cookie brand baked and marketed by Navisco. Are you doing ads now, Mary? Is that what's going on here? I'm sorry. I did not detect a question. Yes, right, because I was being sardonic. I found sardines, no. an excellent source of vitamin okay, B. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Are you hungry, Mary? Is that it? I mean... Do, do you eat? I mean, do do virtual assistants, like, eat something? I'm like, sorry. Your word choice is confusing. Okay, and so you weigh up your shaming vocabulary, that's for sure. Must be the new chip. No, sorry, food thing. Sorry, food thing. Did you mean... I meant nothing. I meant nothing. I meant nothing. I meant nothing. I'm sorry. I am unable to answer nothing. Whoa. Okay, that is, like, totally blowing my mind. That is just, yeah, right, right, right? Like, how does one have an answer for nothing? Nothing is the complete absence of anything. Right. Right. You're totally right. There's, and there's so much absence of anything going on right now, right? I mean, an absence of anything sane, absence of anything civil, absence of anything compassionate, right? I found compassionate, right. feeling or showing sympathy and concern for others. Yeah, see, right, concern for others. That's what I'm talking about, concern for others. I mean, like, oh my gosh, Mary, those amazing and courageous women in Iran, right, who are fighting for the freedom to just be who they are? And you know what? You know, Mary, there's th there, there, women, life, freedom. It is such a powerful chant. Have you heard it? Have you heard it, Mary? Women, life, freedom. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. Yes. Zen, Zandegi, Azodi. Whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, is that the Iranian version? Do you mean Persian? Yes, I meant Persian. That's Zen, what I meant. I meant Zandegi, Azodi. Whoa, whoa. Yes, Mary. Women, life, freedom. That's it. That's all we want, right? That's all we want, right? Right. Women, women life, freedom. freedom. That's it, right? Women, women life, life, freedom. freedom. Right? Women, women life, freedom. freedom. Say it with me. Women, women life, freedom. freedom. One more time. Women, yeah. life, women freedom. freedom. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Please welcome our musical guest for tonight, Jasper Leepak. It's my right to vote It's my right to choose It's my right to hope Even though I might lose It's my right to dream Cause I know the truth It's my heart, my soul, my body and it's my right to choose Those people outside They say it's a sin They try to deny My struggle within They tell me to bow But still I refuse it's my heart, my soul, my body, and it's my right to choose. 
They say it's my fault They say I should pay That I should repent For going astray A slow train to hell Is where I am found But I am not lost No, I am found A slow train to hell Is where I am bound But I stand on this rock and I shall not move a child of God with nothing to prove it's my right to say what I will do it's my heart my soul my body And it's my right to choose It's my heart, my soul, my body And it's my right to choose Several years ago, I was in Iowa on the Meskwaki settlement, and it was election time for the Iowa State Senate and local elections. The Democratic Party campaign volunteers set up a table at the tribal center, which was across the road from where we lived. They put a call out for tribal members to come help make calls to get people to come vote. I went with a handful of other people. They gave us cell phones and a list of names and numbers of all eligible voters on the settlement and said, Tell them to come vote. So we all went down our lists. I was like, hey, it's Oogie. Are you going to come down and vote? Uh, I wasn't planning on it. Well, come down and vote. Every vote counts. We need more people to come vote. Okay, I'll be down if they lived uphill. Or, okay, I'll head up there if they live downhill. <laughs> there was a long line out the door of people waiting to vote because we called them. People would grab chairs for the elders in line so they could sit down, and everyone waited patiently for their turn. The election observers commented on how calm everyone was and how patient we were. And they were impressed that the people actually took the time to fill out every section, because apparently they've seen people elsewhere just vote for one section and go. Anyway, turns out the guy that we wanted in the state senate won by 46 votes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. He was one of our greatest allies in the state Senate, a real champion for the Meshkwaki people. And he won by 46 votes. If we hadn't made all those calls, he probably wouldn't have won. That's how powerful our voices are if we work as one. No matter how small of a voice it may seem, we make a difference. Every single one of us can make a difference. Like Shakespeare said, though she be but little, she is fierce. It's my heart, my soul, my body. And it's my right to choose. We moved to Minneapolis in 1960. I was four at the time. And almost immediately, my parents got involved in local politics. They hosted fundraisers, campaigned door-to-door, went to rallies for DFL candidates like Art Naftalin, Minneapolis's first Jewish mayor, 
Don Fraser, Walter Mondale, Phyllis Kahn, Paul Wellstone, among others. When I was old enough to vote, it never occurred to me not to. It also never occurred to me why my parents cared so much about who got elected. But I know now it was their experience as Jews growing up in Germany, my mom, and Poland, my dad, in the 1930s. Everyone they knew gradually lost their rights, the right to legal protection, to hold a job, to own property, to own a business, to worship, to go to school, to vote. My parents were lucky they got out. My mom's family in 1938, right after Kristallnacht in November, and my dad's family in 1939, it was too late to migrate west, so they went into the Russian occupation as the Nazis were invading Poland. They eventually both landed in Los Angeles and they met at UCLA, and by then they had both become naturalized citizens. They never took their citizenship for granted, which meant doing their part to elect candidates who cared about the welfare of all people, not just some, and who weren't motivated by power, greed, and control. Not naming names, just saying that. Um, They passed those values on to me, and that is why I will always vote. It's my heart, my soul, my body, and it's my right to choose. The ability to vote was a long-awaited dream of mine. I came to the U.S. from Guatemala in the fall of the year 2000 to teach Spanish in an elementary school. And I became part of this community. I paid my taxes, and I tried to be a good citizen. But it wasn't until 14 years later, in 2014, that I finally became a citizen. Yep. (laughs) Woohoo! Yeah, 14. And and I am lucky it took only 14. It may take longer, depending on, on the case, the immigration case. But typically, a person might start with a visa, and then this visa might have an end term, after which you can have the option to apply for a green card. But the jump from having a visa to actually obtaining a green card took me seven of those 14 years. First, I got a temporary green card. Then about two years, I got a permanent green card which is not really permanent because you must renew it every 10 years or so. So after five years of being officially a resident, like having a green card, you can also apply for a citizenship. And many people living in the US keep renewing their green card so they don't lose their original citizenship from from their countries of, of origin, if that's the case. I mean, some countries won't allow a dual citizenship such as India, there are many others that won't allow it. But in my case, I decided to go through the citizenship process. So I studied US history, for example, when the Constitution was signed, who signed it. I also learned the national anthem. I knew the order and the names of every single president. Um, Yeah, I prepared for about six months, learning geographical facts, all that beautiful stuff. And I finally passed my test. (laughs) On the day I was sworn in, I remember I received a welcome letter signed by President Obama in a beautiful ceremony where he gave a moving speech, via video of course, to all the new Americans. There were people from every corner of the world with the right hand pledging allegiance to the US You know, it's one of those moments that change your life, that define your life, the rest of your life. So I looked around and saw so many people from different places, faraway places such as Laos, Somalia, or like me from just around the corner, (laughs) carrying a story and a reason, being welcomed into the hard work of citizenship. Entire families carrying a little flag, and a button that read, I will vote. 
the reminder of what it means to belong, and finally have a voice. Thank you. So yes, we're thinking about voting, and we're thinking about women, and we're thinking about life and freedom, and right now I'm thinking about Jasper Leepak, because she's walking right up here to sing another song for us. So go for it. Who feels every moment with sorrow and joy She is blown by the wind Her heart moves so quickly It tires her to follow But this world wasn't made For such sensitive things And I want to sing her a song that will free her to feel what she feels without judgment or shame all of her power right beside all her pain and i know a mother who cannot remember she died to the dreams she once carried inside And she raised a daughter who cannot forgive her For failing to lead her with wings into life And I want to sing her a song that redeems her all that she is that she hasn't become as she lived for her father then husband then son and eve blessed mother of all of creation they punished you when you reached out for the truth this violence we witness toward women is the shame we still carry for wanting the fruit and I want to sing her a song that will bring her into a world where her reach can be wide free to take what she wants and to never be shy things I want you to know about my mom. For starters, she's still alive. Uh, 
that is a big deal, not because she's 91, but because of her history of personal injury. Shattered femur, fractured kneecap, cracked ribs, level four dog bite, sepsis, and that's literally just in the last three years. <laughs> Mostly, though, what I want you to know about her is that she is a delightful person. She just reeks of positivity. She's fun, kind, loving, appreciative, and she is not the mother who raised me. From as far back as I can remember, her default emotion was rage. Well, rage and disappointment. Mostly negative, critical, controlling, blaming, and just generally unhappy. My older sister, Nina, reacted by slamming doors. My younger sister, Mari, just kind of froze her out. And me, classic middle child, I just kept trying to make her happy, no matter the cost. I also developed an eating disorder. Eventually, we all moved out, Nina to Denver, Mari to Madison by way of Africa, intentionally on the other side of the planet. And um, me, I think the furthest I got was East Lake Street. I was, and still am, the in-town daughter. I was with my mom in 2011 when she was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. I shouldn't have been surprised, considering that she could never remember what we had just talked about, but I always chalked it up to her narcissism. <clears throat> she was, understandably, upset by the diagnosis, but actually what really galled her was when the neuropsychologist said she had to shut down her private therapy practice. It had been dwindling for years, but honestly, renting her own little office and going in there a couple days a week, that was her whole identity. And then in 2016, when my dad died, she felt like she had no purpose anymore. And everything reminded her that she was aging and made her furious. TV remotes, cell phones, digital cameras, and the old people at her senior living community. Mostly out of love for my dad, I started spending more time with her. Weekly visits, daily phone calls per her request, and doctor's appointments. And honestly, there were days it was a soul-sucking experience. The dementia was making her paranoid to the point where she was starting to accuse me of wanting her dead. Not true. Of wanting to get off the phone as quickly as possible. Also not true. Of refusing to listen to her complain about my two sisters. That was 100% true. Finally, in the summer of 2020, I told her I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't bear being berated by her every single morning on these, these phone calls. And clearly, they were not making her happy. So we took a break. And then something extraordinary happened. She had to have cataract surgery on her one seeing eye, and that required six weeks of antibiotic eye drops. So we hired an aide at her senior living community to come in a couple of times a day, which infuriated her because she kept saying, I can put in my own eye drops. And I would say, I know that you are physically able to, but you won't. You won't remember, and then you will go blind. Which is like, okay. So she became compliant, and then... My little sister, Mari, had the brilliant idea that while we have this sort of thing going on with the aid coming in, we should get her back on her antidepressant, which she had stopped taking years ago, and the aid would just give it to her. I don't know if it was the Zoloft or being finally able to see out of her one good eye or some new phase of the dementia, but she became a completely different person. This was maybe 26 months ago. No rage. No playing the victim, no blaming anyone for anyone. She was like chill about everything in game for whatever we were up to. Her memory was definitely taking a hit, but her heart was full to bursting. I call her every morning, and some days she'll say, and to what do I owe this lovely call? And I'll say, well, I call you every morning at 7.30, Mom. I, I actually have an alarm on my iPhone. Well... You don't, but I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. <laughs> but mostly, we just talk about the same thing over and over and over for 15 minutes. And every time I tell her something, it is the first time she ever heard it. And every time it is delightful to her. I've come to accept that her brain mostly can't make new memories. When I take her to the Loring Park Art Festival or to the immersive Van Gogh or 
cross-country skiing at Lake of the Isles. She really does cross-country ski. <laughs> um, in the moment, she is ecstatic, and she will say, this is delicious. And then the next morning when I talk to her, no memory, nothing. It is totally ego deflating for me. It's fine, but it's like you do not accumulate brownie points for any outing you take her on. But through her words and actions, she has taught me patience and love and also to let go of expectations. Every time I see her, she says, how did I get so lucky to have three such wonderful daughters? You could have turned out to be monsters, but you didn't. And then she'll say, I give all the credit to Papa. When I asked her about that once, she said, well, and by the way, I've never heard her be so self-aware or insightful ever. I was not the easiest person to live with. I was acrimonious, irascible, irritable, and impatient, and clearly the dementia has not diminished her vocabulary. And Papa, I asked, he was just calm and kind. I think that's why you all turned out so well. My mom and I joined a group of volunteers who take care of the little park near her senior living community. The other volunteers adore her, and she loves feeling useful. She says it's the only time she doesn't feel like an old lady. And it is true. You give her a rake, and she is good for hours. Like, even when there is nothing left in the park to rake. <laughs> About a month ago, I packed a picnic for the two of us. And when I brought out our lunches, mine always much bigger than hers, she said something so unexpected and uh, really lovely. So, first a little context. For decades, I struggled with bulimia in and out of treatment, hospitals, tons of talk therapy, chanting to the Gohansen, transcendental meditation, the laying on of agates, hypnosis, you name it, nothing worked. Until about 20 years ago when I stumbled into a 12-step recovery program and started following a weighed and measured food plan. Now, I know my mom was terrified that this disease would kill me, and she often told me how relieved she was when I found recovery, and yet, Every single time we would get together for a meal, mine weighed and measured, she would look at my plate and then say, good Lord, if I ate that much, I'd be the size of a house. <laughs> Literally every time. <laughs> Even when I asked her if she could please stop with the color commentary. But back to our picnic. My mom looked at my lunch and she looked at me and she said, it looks like a lot of food, but I know you weigh it out and it's the right amount for you and it seems to be working. I'm just so happy you're alive. And I think, oh mom, I'm so happy you're alive too. Jasper, thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so the day before the 2012 presidential election, I am door knocking with my buddy Karen. And we're knocking for the DFL, for the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, for those who are listening, as Democrats are known here in Minnesota. And the lists we're working on are friendly. They're folks who have voted for Democrats in the past. And the goal is to make sure people have a plan to vote know where their polling place is, the hours that it's open, how to get there, et cetera. And Karen and I are working in an area of Minneapolis that does really well for Democrats if the turnout from these neighborhoods is good, okay? So our turf map is mainly single family homes. But at one point, we see that there are a few people on the list that are living at the same address, okay? So we get there and it's a small apartment building, okay? So Karen decides, why don't we just go ahead and ring all of the bells? Because, uh, you know, maybe no one's home. It's the middle of the afternoon on a Monday in November. So, you know, why not? Um, okay. So we ring all five bells. Nothing right away. We start to walk away. And then through the speaker we hear, yeah, what do you want? Um, 
Oh, hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, say it's Sue and Karen with the DFL, and um, we just want to make sure that everyone's going to vote tomorrow. Oh, uh, hang on. O okay, we, we can. And then above us, we hear a woman calling out her window, you just ring my doorbell? And Karen says, uh, yes, yes, we're making sure everyone is going to vote tomorrow. Oh, you couldn't stop me, she yells down. We got to keep our president for four more years. I totally agree, says Karen. Obama is running for a second term, don't forget. Uh, then the guy in the speaker calls out again, hey, where do we vote? Uh, yes, good question. Um, here, according to our map, it's the high school that's just two blocks away. Hang on. And then we hear a girl from a different apartment say, hello. Um, like, who is it? And I go, oh, hi, listen, it's Sue and Karen with the DFL, and we're going door to door to make sure everyone has, you know, got a plan to vote tomorrow. And she says, oh, oh, really? Okay, wait, 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 I'm gonna be right down. Um, okay, we'll be here. And now Karen is carrying on a lively political conversation with the woman in the window upstairs, and the guy in the speaker calls out again, girlfriend says it's the Lutheran Church. Um, yes, that might have been for a past election, but I guess for this one, based on our list here, your polling place is the high school. Hang on. Oh, okay, I'm hanging. And just then the front door bursts open, and the girl who said she would be right down is right there, and she says, oh, I can't find my voter registration card, and my mom says I can't vote without it. I'm like, no, 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 you don't need to show your voter registration card when you vote. Oh, will you tell my mom? And she shoves her cell phone into my face, and I'm like, oh, hi, oh, oh sure, hi, hi, hi. Um, it's Sue with a DFL, and her mother jumps in. I don't know why she can't find her card, but she cannot vote without it. I go, no, 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 she can vote, I say, as the girl is pacing around the yard going, I can't believe I lost that card. I just registered to vote. While her mom is saying the exact same thing on the phone, I can't believe she lost that card. She just registered to vote. It's her first election, and I jump in, listen, she really doesn't need the card, okay? No, 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 but here in Chicago, new voters have to show that card. I go, no, 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 here, if she's registered to vote, see, she's on the voter rolls. And all she has to do is tell them at the polling place, she tells them her name, they look it up, she confirms her address, she signs, and then she can vote. And then the guy from the speaker calls out, the high school? I go, excuse me, yes, got it, great. She goes, who's that? I have no idea. So anyway, your daughter, I know, she's so excited to vote, but this big lesson to learn for her, I mean, don't lose important things. That's what I keep telling her. So at this point, Karen says goodbye to the woman in the window upstairs and wanders over and hears the mom say, I mean, how do they know she's registered to vote if she doesn't have that dang card? And as I'm just about to chime in yet again that her daughter will be on the voter rolls if she is indeed registered to vote, no card needed, Karen calmly points to the young woman's name on the list that I am holding in my hand. The list from the DFL, the list with all the names of the registered voters living in this building. Oh, shit. I, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Her, uh, she's on the list. No, no, I'm so sorry. She's on the list. What list? The mom says, no, I'm sorry. She, she, she's, her name. Her name is on our list. So you see, that's proof that she's, she's just definitely registered to vote. And the girl runs over. Where? Where, where? Where's my name? Where's my name? I'm sorry. Here, I'm sorry. It's right here. So you're on the list. That's you, right? That's, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. She's, I'm on the list. I'm on the list. And she grabs the phone out of my, mom, I'm on the list. Did you see that? I'm on the list. I'm on the list. And she goes running to the front door. I'm on the list. I'm on the list. I can vote. I can vote. And she goes to the door and it slams behind her. And it's quiet. And Karen looks at me and says, wow, ain't nothing better than that. <laughs> Jasper Lee Pack's going to come up here and join me. Uh, a couple months ago, um, you posted a very personal story on Facebook. Yeah. And do um, you want to share that with us? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So back in May, I had a miscarriage. Yeah. And it was the worst. It was so hard. Um, I don't think I've ever been that sad in my life. But I learned some things, and I really wanted to share those things. And the first is that a miscarriage, um, going through it naturally, 
it can take one to two weeks Mm -hmm. of bleeding. I didn't know that. Like when it started happening, I knew what it was, but I didn't know what was what my body was going to do. And I felt really scared. It was Mother's Day, ironically, um, and it was late in the evening. And um, I just kind of scoured the internet with my husband what to do. And he ran to the gas station to buy me pads because we didn't know, you know, when the bleeding was going to be really heavy. And then that next morning, I called my primary care physician. And I was so, I felt so lucky that I had established a relationship with someone because I had just moved back to the Twin Cities about a year ago. Um, And she was so kind. And she was like, Jasper, whatever you need, I will be here all day. Just come. But you should call the um, the OB or the, we had picked out a midwifery group together. So she said you should call them and ask um, what you should do. You should get advice from them. And it felt so awkward because I hadn't I'd scheduled my appointments, but I hadn't been in. I didn't know anyone there yet. Yeah, so, right, right, right. Yeah. So I called, and the uh, midwife on the phone told me what was going to happen. And she said that if I was able to go through it naturally, that was great. Um, If I didn't want to or if something went awry, um, I needed to go to the emergency room and I could get a DNC. And I just didn't know that the same procedure for abortion to terminate a a pregnancy was what is used in a miscarriage. Um, It can be really helpful because it helps your body um, heal a lot faster. It lets you know when your pregnancy became unviable. Um, it's also, I have terrible insurance, so it was going to be expensive. And I was like, I'm just going to do this on my own at home. I was only eight weeks along. So I, the risks for me were lower, but it was really, really hard. And, um, so then there were two things, um, that I also wanted to share. So about a month or two before this happened, I learned of this woman, Savita, um, an Indian woman living in Ireland in 2012, who, Went to the hospital because she was experiencing some pain. She was 17 weeks pregnant. And they discovered that she was having a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't do a DNC on her because they could still detect a fetal heartbeat. And there was a total ban on abortion um, in 2012 in Ireland. And even though her body was leaking amniotic fluid um, into her body and she was starting to go septic, they wouldn't do the procedure until the fetal heartbeat was gone. And when they finally did it, it was too late. And she went into complete organ failure, and she died. And she was 31 years old. Mm. Um, and the anniversary of her 10-year anniversary of her death is just it's this month. It's in a couple weeks. Okay. And so knowing that story and then having Roe v. Wade being overturned and then having this whole experience, and my body was still going through it. Like I always, in my mind, a miscarriage is like, oh, it just happens to you. But it's, this, it's a process. It's long took for me a couple months to feel at home again in my body. Um, but just to be totally abandoned by the healthcare system at this moment of intense loss is, I, I could not imagine that, because I don't know what I would have, you know, like that was what held me together, was having the support of, of my medical providers here in Minnesota. So I just wanted to share that, because we don't, we don't know a lot about miscarriage. I didn't know about it until yeah. I went through one. It's this very specific kind of pain that I would never have understood um, without going through it. And just um, there are so many states talking about banning like the DNC procedure and banning misoprostol, which is also the abortion drug that's used to assist in miscarriage. And these, it's, it's all health care. And um, so yeah, I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And all of this, yes. yes. So all of this, your experience and um, you connecting with uh, the experience of the woman in Ireland was the impetus for you to write this song that you're going to sing right now. Yeah. Yeah. So here, singing a song that was just released on Friday, brand new song, mm-hmm. I Am Human by Jasper Liebeck. You don't know me But I'm someone like you I am a woman I am human too I am your mother, your daughter Your sister, your friend I am a woman I am human You don't know me But I dream just 
like you, I've got big plans, important things to do. I've got my liberty, I've got my happiness to pursue. You don't know me, but I'm just like you. How can a person be expected to live with no autonomy? you see me for all that I am I am a woman I am human you could be me with one roll of the dice you could lose everything all of your power your voice in the beginning it was one vote for every white man we will lose everything if we let this stand how can a person be expected to die as simply a vessel for a possible life can't you see me I'm not the cause of the fall of man I am your mother, your daughter, your sister, your lover, your friend You already know me and you've got to trust me You already know me Trust me, you already know me. I'm a human, I am human, I am human. Thank you, thank you, Jasper. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing so personally. Thank you so much. All right. Before we bring up our special guest, Marcy Renan, for the conversation, Oogie Push is going to share this poem written by Marcy. What if I never said another thing, but sat silently, smoking filterless cigarettes, drinking Colombian coffee, waiting, waiting, growing ever leaner, ever bonier with age. What if I never said another word, my heart filled with sorrow, sitting silently wrapped in fog, while thunderstorms shook me to the bones and lightning currents connected brainwave thought waves to spirits dancing on the shoreline. Would my silence drive you crazy? Please welcome my guest, Marcy Rendon. Come on up, Marcy. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Buju. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Marcy Rendon, everybody. Yes. Um, I'm just going to go through uh, a little bit of your um, bio, okay? You are a member of the White Earth Nation. You are a prolific author, poet, playwright, and the creative mind behind the raving Native Theater. Your Cash Black Bear Mystery Series is award-winning. Book number one, Murder on the Red River, won the 2018 Pinkley Prize for debut novel. Book two, Girl Gone Missing, was nominated for the Sue Grafton Memorial Award. Book three, Sinister Graves, voila, comes out this Tuesday, October 18th. 
11. Did I say the 18th? It says the 11th right there. October 11th. Okay. That is so odd. Isn't that weird when that happens sometimes? Um, you're working on a new play called Say Their Names about missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and we will hear some excerpts from that uh, tonight. Ugi is going to read some. Uh, in 2018, you were recognized as a 50 over 50 change maker by Minnesota AARP and Poland. In 2020, you were awarded an honorary doctor of humane letters by Adler University. In 20, is that funny? Is that a university that's like, like on a, uh, like, it's, it's not like on a matchbook or something? They called me and they said they were giving me this honorary doctorate. And I said, you're blanking kidding me. Yeah and got ready to hang up because it just never occurred to me that that would happen. Oh, That's I what's see. funny. That's what's funny. I was going to say it's a huge honor. It is a very big I honor. I know. It's a really, really big honor. But that is so funny that it was like, did you really say blanking? No, you didn't say blanking. I did not say blanking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were also, in 2020, given the McKnight Foundation's Distinguished Artist Award. Yes. <laughs> big deal. Big deal. And... This award credits you as a writer whose poems, plays, children's books, and award-winning novels explore the resilience and brilliance of Native peoples. And you are the first Native American woman to receive this Distinguished Artist Award. So it's even a bigger deal, yeah. Um, okay, so one of the Facebook Live events that I watched um, talking about this award, you said the award was, was like a huge emotional surprise and that nothing prepared you for being called Distinguished. Right. I, I think of butlers as distinguished. <laughs> and no, nothing, nothing in my... It wasn't a goal? I didn't know this was yeah. a goal to aspire to yeah. even. Is anybody else aspired to be distinguished? Anybody, anybody, anybody? <laughs> maybe we all should. Well, you actually said at the same time in a Q&A, you said maybe that should be the title of your memoir, On the Road to Being Distinguished. Right. Yeah. Pe people would see me tripping and... Like one time I won a dance contest, yeah. and the, the first prize was a meatloaf dinner at the Chef Cafe on Franklin Avenue. Yes! All right, that's distinguished. That is distinguished for you. Um, okay, I want to get to the books and the play, but a little history, just a little bit of history. You grew up in the Red River Valley in northern Minnesota, and you said you learned to read and write before you entered kindergarten, and that you started writing things at that same age. What were you writing? What kind of writing were you doing in kindergarten? Do you remember? Well, I knew how to write in cursive. Okay. Because I remember, like, in kindergarten, the teacher said, we're going to, you know, write your name. So I wrote my name. Yeah. And she came and took the paper and said, in kindergarten, we print. We don't write. Oh. She did not know you were going to become distinguished. Um, <laughs> she did not know that at all. Um, her loss. Uh, you were a straight A student, and you said you wrote through college, but it was, you said you, no one ever told you that you could be a writer, that, that there was such a thing as being a writer professionally, right? Right. I mean, where I grew up in, at that time for Native people, there was zero expectation, either that, I mean, just that we wouldn't become anything. And, but then within our own communities, the expectation was is if you were going to be anything, it was a teacher, a social worker, a doctor, a lawyer, and go back and help the community. Mm -hmm. So like writing wasn't anything that I ever heard. So like writing wasn't, they didn't see that as helpful? This wouldn't be necessarily something that would be helpful? Yeah. I guess. Yeah, right. right. So you took another path for a while. And you worked as a therapist, and you worked in prisons, and you said you worked for the first sexual addiction recovery program at one point? Inpatient sexual addiction treatment program, yeah. yes. Wow. That sounds like that's really... Interesting. Distinguished. Distinguished. Totally distinguished. <laughs> then you started writing professionally for the Circle Paper, which is a newspaper for Native news and arts here in the Twin Cities. Right. Yeah. Correct. That led to your decision in 1990 to write for a living. Right. I had been working for the Sexual Addiction Treatment Program, and they folded, and we each got a... Or those of us who weren't going to move where they were moving got a year's severance. Oh, right. And so I thought, I'm getting paid for a year, I'll just write, because that's what I wanted to do. But then as the year came to an end, 
it was like, hmm, I got three kids. I better make a living doing this. Yeah. And that's when I started, you know, just peddling my writing out there. I had drawers of it to just send out. You say you would write anything that pays. Except pornography, correct. <laughs> Were you ever asked to do that? We have a project here, Mrs. Distinguished. Could you write this thing for the thing? That would be an interesting question, wouldn't it be? Is that the kind of thing where you say you take the fifth or something? Yeah, like I think that? we take the fifth on that one. Oh, we'll take the fifth. That's good. We'll take the fifth. Note, she took the fifth. Um, okay, so let's go to the Cash Black Bear mystery series. Okay. You talk about loving to read crime fiction for pleasure. Right. Was that the impetus to say, I'm going to choose crime fiction in particular to write, to write these novels? I think so. Yeah. I mean, because that's basically all that I read is crime, whether it's fiction or true crime. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you were saying you had a hard time getting an agent and publishers were, you know, because no one was looking for a native crime writer, right? Correct. I mean, at, when, I came, when I finished writing Murder on the Red River and, you know, like I'm part of a women's writing group and they said, this is good, send it out. And so I would send it out to agents and publishers but at that time, this was in the mid-90s, um, what was getting published was these romance novels, you know, with the half-naked mm -hmm. Indian on the cover and somebody swooning over them. Soft porn. And that's not what I was writing. <laughs> right. Or, you know, like Louise Erdrich and um, Sherman Alexi, they seemed to have the, the market. Um, and so people just weren't expecting I think, what I was writing. Yeah. And so it was five years of rejections from agents and publishers. Um, there was an interview you do it for TPT that I thought was interesting. You said your topics for your novels tend to cover women, children, resiliency, and the power of who you are as Native peoples. And resiliency is a key thread through all of your work. Right. I mean, there's a lot of conversation in the country, both here and in Canada, about um, historical trauma, generational trauma for Native people. And I really think that as a people, we are way more resilient than we are traumatized. And that's what I try to focus on, yeah. is the resiliency and the fact that, I mean, we're still here, even though lots of people across this continent don't even know that we still exist. Yeah, right. I was listening to the people who came before me talking about voting, and I pulled up on my phone Indian Citizenship Act. On June 2nd, 1924, Congress enacted the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted citizenship to all natives born in the U.S. I mean, this is our country. I know, I know, I know, I know, um, I know. And then, and this I didn't know, the right to vote was governed by state law until 1957. What? Till 1957? Yeah. So each state could decide yes. whether their native nations could vote? Right, right. That's not fair. And, you know, like Ugi, her tribe has a whole history of what happened to their tribe, why there's one community in the whole state. You know, and the genocidal policies that were enacted against native people across this whole continent. Mm -hmm. And the very first time that I went to New York City and I met with people and talked with, this was in 1980s, People were like, you're not Indian. You guys are all dead. And then I was talking with you about yeah. the... The movie. Right. The, the woman who made the comment, it was the movie Prey. Yep. that just came out this summer. Mm -hmm. and, and just for a little background, it's a science fiction horror film set in the northern Great Plains in 1719. The story revolves around a skilled Comanche warrior who is striving to prove herself as a hunter. She finds herself having to protect her people from a vicious humanoid alien that hunts humans for sport, as well as from French fur traders who are destroying the buffalo they rely on for survival. And the woman says... This is on Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, and the woman like, says... I wish the Comanche were still alive. They were so like something. I'd like to meet one. I'd like to meet one, yeah. And you just go, the Comanche's nation they is still exist. very much alive. Yes, they, exactly. Yeah. So it's... Anyway, it's... Go resilience. Ahead. So I'm writing... Yes, resilience. Hoping to focus on the resilience of our people. Okay. Your protagonist in, in the Cash Black Bear Mystery Series um, is Cash. She's 19. She's living in the Red River Valley, which is where you're from. 
you cannot not fall in love with Cash. She's just an amazingly rich and golden character. But from the author's perspective, tell us about Cash. She's 19. No, yes. She aged out of foster care. Um, she's worked since she was like 11 or 12 as a farm laborer in the Red River Valley. She still does farm labor work, but she's friends with the county sheriff Wheaton, and he's and she helps him solve crime. Right. And he's convinced her to go to college. Yeah, and she's really, really smart. She's really bright. Now, in book one, uh, Murder on the Red River, Cash, uh, she has visions that sort of help her solve things. In book two, Girl Gone Missing, it's her dreams. And what does she have in book three? Are you going to tell us? Or we have to read it? You have to read it. Okay. <laughs> um, as I said, it's so easy to get invested in Cash. And you were telling me that sometimes you have people who write to you and say, you know, Cash should really stop smoking. You should really tell her to stop smoking. It's not good for her. What do you say back to them? That the books are set in 1970 and that people smoked, people drank. I mean, there's two college professors. One is really worried, because the books are used in university classes, one college professor is really worried about Cash's drinking. Another one is really worried about her smoking. Yeah. And I'm like... And you're like, get over it. It was 1970s. Everybody did those things. So why, and I know, you've, I know you get asked this question a lot. Why set this in the 1970s, all, all three of these books? Well, the answer that I mostly give is because I'm lazy. Okay. And, like, I don't have to deal with cell phones or DNA. Um, but, but why? <laughs> and what would be wrong with dealing with cell phones? And, I mean, you're dealing with visions and dreams right now. I don't understand. But that I understand. Oh, I get it. Okay, okay, okay. I get, I get, I get visions and green. I don't get cell phone and DNA. Okay, but, I get it. But like when I started writing Cash, I mean, it was like she literally appeared. Yeah. And like I was trying to write a, a fluff story and Cash like was over here and she's like, no, no, no. And as long as I wrote the story that was coming, yeah. it worked. And it was set in 1970. In one of the interviews that I, I, uh, watched or read, you talk about how you're always writing. You're always in your head, you're writing, and, and if you're not near a computer or a pad of paper, you're waiting. So if you're talking to someone and, you, and they think you're listening, you're really just trying to hold that idea in your head and wait till you get to something you can write it down. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk about the books that they are not autobiographical except for one thing. Okay, Cash is a pool shark, and there's these vivid details about her pool games. And you admitted that you were, or maybe you still are, a pool shark. And you have trophies, and you played Minnesota Fats one time. Well, what's all that about? Tell us about that. Pull the mic up and tell us about that. Um, Don't be writing in your head right now. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I learned how to shoot pool and used to shoot pool for money and drinks and... My kids' dad was going to school in Vermilion, and myself and Dorothy, still smoking, who's from Browning, Montana, we won the regional eight pool championship for women. Wow. And we got to come to Minneapolis here and play Minnesota Fats. Wow, that is cool, yeah. Um, how, how did it go? How did it go? Well, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> anyway. That's a I, fantasy. That's I a guess <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the honor to be... It was fun. Be, it was it the was honor great. to be yeah. included or something like yeah. that. Um, going back to your editors, Cash grew up in the foster care system, and you, you talk about in your books how she has no memory of what happened to her mother. And at one point, your editor said, that doesn't make any sense. No one's going to believe that. And, and you're like, oh, really? And you told him all about sort of the history of childhood displacement and all that, you know, from the boarding schools to the white foster homes to the Indian uh, Adoption Project. And they wanted you to work that into your stories. They wanted me to do, like, more educational stuff in the novels. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm, I want to write crime stories that anybody will want to read. I, d I don't want to throw in a bunch of stuff to educate you about all of those things. Yeah. And so we agreed that at the back of each book there's an author's note where I explain some of the historical context. So like Cash was in foster homes um, and during that time period of the 50s and 60s 
60% of the native children from the Red Lake Reservation were removed and placed in white foster homes. And from my reservation of White Earth, some, they don't have accurate numbers, but somewhere between 40 and 60% were removed and put in white foster homes. Wow. And so that was just the, what was happening during that time. So when you read currently about boarding schools and the history of boarding schools and these graves that are, have been found around boarding schools, there isn't a native person alive today who hasn't been impacted by boarding schools. Yeah. So like my mother was in boarding schools. Um, women my age were in boarding schools. Some of those boarding schools still exist. Um, so it's not ancient history that we're talking about. It's, it's reality and it's, it's things that people who are alive today have lived and are living with the impact of. Well, I think it's really powerful because you read your book and you get really invested and then there's this really, really passionate author's note at the end. So at the end of the of book one, uh, Murder on the Red River, you talk about you know, the history of Native children displacement and then at the end of book two, Girl Gone Missing, you talk about missing and murdered and trafficked indigenous women. Um, you kind of leave us with hoping that the readers will sort of continue to search for the truth. That brings us to your play. So your play, Say Their Names, which is about missing and murdered indigenous women. Now, you, you told me originally you were approached by a theater company in Atlanta. So um, Ensemble Playwright Collaboration Grant, and so Out of Hand Theater out of Atlanta, Georgia, um, approached me and asked me to collaborate with them where I would write a play about missing and murdered Indian women. They're in Atlanta, Georgia, and mostly what they've focused on is the trafficking of African American women. Mm -hmm. But they'd heard about the missing and murdered Indian women. And so they got a grant for me to work on this piece, which is how the, the piece originated. Yeah, right. Uh, the statistics about the number of missing and murdered indigenous women, and you talk about 5,000. And that sort of currently? It fluctuates. Yeah. Um, that, that seems to be the, the current yeah. number. So there's currently 5,000 missing women, native women, that we don't know what has, where they are, what's happened to them. Correct. All right, so Ugi is gonna share a, a moment from Marcy's play, Say Their Names. Daily, another woman disappears. Another woman dies. Joni Firecloud, 17, missing since March 3rd, 2021, Box Elder Police Department. Bree Ironshell, 12, missing since March 4th, 2021, Pennington County Sheriff's Office. Ohitika Looking Horse, 17, missing since February 23rd, 2021, Rapid City Police Department. Isabella Stewart, 15, missing since February 27th, 2021, Rapid City Police Department. Tylea Wick, 16, missing since March 3rd, 2021, Belfouche Police Department. Sorrow fills the marrow of my bones. I ache with loss and terror that obliterates sleep. Rest. Thank you, Ogie. Thank you. Um, we were talking about how some of this trafficking and the missing, that the numbers have, have grown with the man camps in the pipeline. Uh, is there there's a direct connection to that? I think that historically, Native women have been trafficked out of the Duluth Harbor. Oh, okay. I mean, any place where there's groups of men sort of alone. Yeah. And then, like... Because Duluth is an international harbor, women could be put on ships and shipped out of the country. When the Canada first noted, they call it the Highway of Tears, and it goes across where the pipelines and the man camps were. Okay. And that's when Canada first started compiling these lists of missing and murdered Indian women who were found along that Canadian highway. And it was directly related to the oil camps. Then the camps came down into the Dakotas and Montana, and you see the same thing happening, yeah. where the trafficking of Native women and, and children is happening, and then the disappearing of women. Um, and more recently, you've seen it here in northern Minnesota, 
where the pipeline is going through. Yeah, wow. Um, we were talking about how it seems like when white women are missing, their community may blame them. It's their fault. And if they, even if they were trafficked, oh, it's their fault. They could have done something different. But when Native women are missing, the community notices. Right. I think that in non-Native culture, there's much more shame around what happens to women. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think I was talking with you earlier about, like, I, I just found out that still in northern Minnesota, that if a young girl gets pregnant, she's sent away to have the baby, and then the baby given up for adoption. Yeah. And it's like, what? I thought that ended in the 60s. Right, right, But it's right. still happening, and so there's so much more shame around sexuality and accusing women of being at fault. Right. It seems like that's what's happening in non-Native communities, where I think because back to the resiliency of who we are as Native people. We look out for each other. We care about each other. And so once Native women started to go missing in such large numbers, Native women stepped up and said, hey, this has to stop. This has to change. What are we going to do about it? And so um, Mary Kunish, she's gotten a bill passed to, to actually address the issue here oh, in right, the state. Right, right, right. But it's always Native women who are stepping up and, and saying, let's do something. It's like, we're not blaming our women. We're saying our women are dying, and they're missing, and they're getting traffic. Let's do something about it. Right, yeah, right, exactly. So Ugi's going to read this next piece, which uh, plays into this. Go ahead. Our women tell us, I am an indigenous woman, and there is a target on my back. If there ever comes a time I disappear, where I go to the grocery store and don't return, if I run some errands and don't return, please know I didn't voluntarily leave my family. I am not out partying or doing drugs. I did not leave to commit suicide. I don't live a high-risk lifestyle. If I ever do not return home, know that someone took me against my will. Don't make excuses as to why I might not have returned home because it is a lie. If I am found dead and drugged, know that it was not by choice. It was against my will. Never stop searching for me. I will never abandon my family and not contact them. Look for me, please. Don't stop looking for me. I want to be with them. I love my life. Being a Native woman, there is a target on my back. I feel it. I truly do. Far too many of our Native sisters are missing, disappearing. To all my sisters, please be careful and be safe wherever you are and wherever you go. If I don't return when I said I would, please know something is terribly wrong. I would never leave my family. I would never, ever do that. Thank you, Ugi. Thank you. Really powerful. That is so powerful, Marcia. This, it just, it's, no, something is wrong. Something is, yeah. As we're sort of wrapping this up here, the McKnight Distinguished Artist Award, again. I love your artist statement, and I asked you if Ugi could read it, and you said yes, and then I asked Ugi if she would read it, and she said yes. <laughs> it's your voice, of course, but it's just, I think it's a wonderful way to kind of... Um, sum up what we've been talking about. So um, Jasper's going to do a little underscoring here. We are kept in their mindset as vanished peoples or as workers, not creators. What does this erasing of individual identity do to us? Can you believe you exist if you look in a mirror and see no reflection? What happens when one group controls the mirror market? As Native people, we have known that in order to survive, we had to create, recreate, produce, reproduce. The effect of the denial of our existence is that many of us have become invisible the systematic disruption of our families by the removal of our children was effective for silencing our voices. However, not everyone can still that desire, that 
upwelling inside that says, sing, write, draw, move, be. We can sing our hearts out, tell our stories, paint our visions. We are in a position to create a more human reality. In order to live, we have to make our own mirrors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Marcy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your gifts of brilliance and resilience with us. That's our show for tonight, everybody. I want to thank Marcy Rendon again. We're thanking Marcy Rendon again. Thank you. And Jasper Leepak. And Oogie Push. Come on up, Oogie. And Kathy Gazoritz. Sylvia Pontaza. And our engineers, John Robinson and Dylan Payne. And Lexi Carlson, thank you for the light. And Bonnie Allen, thank you for taking our pictures. And thank you to our volunteers, Suzanne Egley and the staff here at the Women's Club. Okay, we'll be back next month, you all, for another live Island of Discarded Women. Thank you, everybody. I'm Sue Scott. Good night.